Thank you, John. That was really beautiful. <clears throat> Please join me in the call to worship found in our worship guide. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Let those who know they are redeemed celebrate it, those who have been reclaimed from deep trouble. Though we were as good as dead, God made us alive with the grace of Christ, through whom we are rescued and healed. Oh, give thanks to God for such unswerving love, for such wonderful deeds for children of earth. Let us pray together, saying, too often, too easily, our eyes are drawn down, God, to the suffering of victims and the pain of perpetrators, to the wounds we inflict on others and the wounds we inflict on ourselves. We need to see these things and pray. But we also need our eyes to be lifted, God, to the signs of your life among us, to the touch of your healing on our souls, to the cross that casts its liberating shadow across all human affairs. We need our eyes to be lifted, God, so our hearts may be filled with faith and hope and love. Amen. I invite you to rise in body or in spirit to join in singing hymn number 466. You may be seated. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins together using the prayer of confession found in this morning's worship guide followed by a time of silent prayer. Let us pray. God, we confess that we are an impatient and selfish people. When you offer us the promise of a new future, we complain that you don't get there fast enough. When you provide for our needs, we complain that it isn't enough. And when our bad attitudes and negative outlooks cause us to stumble, we blame you. Holy God, forgive our sinful ways. Teach us to be patient. Instruct us to be grateful. Guide us to be responsible and humble as we turn ourselves around and look to the cross. Let us experience your grace and your gift of new life. Accept these, the prayers of our hearts, both spoken and unspoken, and cried out. 
which we offer in the strong name of Jesus our Lord. And let God's people say, Amen. Amen. God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that through him the world might be saved. Though we were dead through our sins, in great mercy God has spoken a word of healing and made us alive together with Christ. Sisters and brothers, our sins are forgiven. Be at peace. Okay, please rise in body and spirit to sing. Since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us share signs of reconciliation and peace with one another. The peace of Christ be with you. Also with you. Thank you, and please greet one another with the peace of Christ. Peace, peace Deb. Peace, peace. <laughs> That's my granddaughter. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I was That's wondering who that was. That's my granddaughter. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> How old is she, Deb? <laughs> She's like 15 months. So yeah, she doesn't seem too happy.
Oh, choir. You do such nice things. Okay, please join me in the prayer for illumination as together we pray. As we are gathered here today, we ask you, our living God, to shower us with your wisdom and knowledge. We pray that as we listen to your word, we may have the ability to see what, what God has called us to do. We seek to live to fill your purpose so that we can see your kingdom. Illuminate our eyes and reveal to us your glory. Amen. Our first scripture reading comes to us from the book of Numbers, reading from the 21st chapter, beginning at verse 4. Listen for God's word. <clears throat> from Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it on a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, now join me, please, in the responsive reading from Psalm 107. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those he redeemed from trouble. And gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some were sick through their sinful ways, and because of their inequities, endured affliction. They loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them, and delivered them from destruction. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind. And let them offer thanksgiving sacrifices, and tell of his deeds with songs of joy. Our New Testament lesson comes from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 2. Continue to listen for the word of the Lord. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses. And we were by nature children of wrath, just like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not the result of work so that no one may boast, for we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Well, I'm sure we all know 
something about Alexander the Great, maybe from sixth grade world history. He made his way across into Asia, planning to conquer everything in his sight. When he came to the capital city of Phrygia in 333 BC, he found at the center of the city an ancient wagon. Around the yoke and the tongue of the wagon was a knot so entangled it was impossible to untie. Now there was an oracle who said anyone who can unravel the knot would rule all of Asia. Alexander looked at the knot, pulled out his sword, cut it in half, and moved on to conquer all of Asia. Patience is not one of my virtues, so every so often my husband calls me Alexander the Great. <laughs> it's so much easier to just cut through. The people of God are not very patient. In numbers, the uh, scripture that Deb read, they're complaining. They don't like this disgusting food. It's the manna they're talking about. They complained about the missing food they had in Egypt. And they also wept and wept and said, oh, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish that we used to eat in Egypt for nothing. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up and there is nothing at all but this manna. And here in chapter 21, our text for today, they complain about the manna and who knows what else. We detest this miserable food. When will we get out of here? What else do we need to do to get out of this wilderness? There are snakes in this text as well. Poisonous, or as the Hebrew says, fiery snakes. In verse 6, it says, The Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people. They bit the people, so many Israelites died. Neither the narrator or God ever explicitly says that God sent the snakes because the people complained. That cause does seem to be implied, especially because the people themselves name their speaking against God and Moses as the ultimate source of their suffering. The text states that God sent, sends the snakes, but neither God nor the narrator call the snakes a punishment. The people name their sin and then ask Moses to pray for them. And this role as intermediary is one of the roles that Moses takes on and does best at, facilitating communication between God and God's people. And in this story, God does not give the people what they ask for. They want Moses to get God to take the snakes away. But the serpents don't go away, and they don't stop biting. Instead, God instructs Moses on how to heal the people who are bitten. They're still bitten, but they live. Deliverance does not come in the way that they expect. God tells Moses what to do to keep them safe after they realize they've insulted Moses and God. Put a poisonous snake on top of a pole. Anyone who's been bitten and looks at the snake will live. Whew. That's good news. God comes through, even for disgruntled, impatient people. By the way, I really hate snakes. I really do. When we moved to New Jersey, our, yeah, here we go. our children were really little. And um, that first Easter in the spring, we went to my in-laws in Pennsylvania. And over dinner, my mother-in-law said, you know, where you live in, in Stillwater, you should really have a snake bite kit. And I said, there's no poisonous snakes east of the Delaware. And she said, who told you that? <laughs> and slowly sinking below the table. <laughs> Turns out that Fiddler's Elbow, which comes down into Stillwater Township, comes off a mountain that is the breeding ground for timber rattlers, and there's copperheads all over the place. So I took those two little boys, who were three and six, 
and said, yes, you can go up in the, in the hills, but you have to take the dog with you. And I talked to the dog, and I said, if you see a snake, you sacrifice yourself. <laughs> and I took them into the Bronx Zoo. We went on a trip as a family, and I dragged them into the reptile house and put their little faces up to the glass. And I said, this is a timber rattler. This is a copperhead. It really bothered me. I, I was much happier living with the illusion that there were no poisonous snakes east of the Delaware. I really hate snakes. But it sounds like the people who were in the wilderness with Moses also hated snakes. But generations later, Israelites were found worshiping this bronze snake on the pole. They'd obviously forgotten the story of the healing power of the snake on the pole. It's like a caduceus that medical uh, people in the medical profession use as a symbol of their, their call to serve in medicine. And at that time, the good king Hezekiah, who was one of the good kings, removed all the idols and sacred poles and sacred trees that the Israelites were worshiping instead of God. He did that to bring them back to worshiping God alone. He also broke the pole and the bronze snake of Moses. You can read it in the Second Kings. For, as it says in this text, until those days the people of Israel had made offerings to it. It's just kind of made an interesting switch. I have to wonder, what if the people had been more patient? What is the advantage of being patient? Well, patience teaches us to take the time to unravel the complex knots before us rather than simply hacking them in half. Patience may mean that we do not worship the things that God has put in place for us, but we continue to worship God, who is with us, caring for us. Patience may mean that we need to listen, truly listen and take in what is being said. Patience may mean that we wait on the words and the acts of God, who is not ours to control or predict. As 21st century Christians, we are easily taken out of our comfort zones to imagine God as an unpredictable presence in our lives. Yet, if we claim, try to claim, that we have God all figured out, then we've ignored the mystery and the divine freedom that we hear about in stories like this. A domesticated, unmoved, and unmoving God does not pull a people out of slavery, through the wilderness, and into the promised land. We probably all remember wandering in a desert in a land of COVID, our patience worn thin. There's a familiarity about this complaining, isn't there? Oh, we, we could complain. We used to be able to go out to eat. Why do we have to keep wearing masks? Some of our complaints were heart-wrenching. We missed family gatherings. We lost family and friends to the virus. We were out of work, couldn't pay our, our rent or our mortgage. But some complaints were just frivolous. It's been over a year since I went on a cruise. I just want to go to the shore and do what I always do. I want to go to my favorite restaurant. Why did I get sick? I'm a good person. You can add your own complaints. We all have them. And in the middle of all our complaining and our fear, then and now, is God. I hope we're learning the truth that we cannot control God or God's mercy or God's faithfulness. I hope we can learn patience to wait upon God and one another. This is the fourth Sunday of Lent. We're halfway through our journey to the cross. Now we're going to sing one of our fav my favorite hymns, and the number's wrong in your bulletin. It's, I don't know how that happened. These things happen. It's actually 356. Come thou fount of every blessing. The lines that I love most in this hymn are these. O oh, to grace, how great a debtor I'm constrained to be. Let that grace now like a fetter.
bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart. O oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. All our complaining, all our impatience, it's all for nothing. As Paul writes in his letter to Ephesians, we heard this morning, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before him to be our way of life. We can take no credit for our salvation, our well-being, or the state of life that we have. What we can do is wait patiently upon the will of God, which is meant for good. So thanks be to God for the gift of patience, even for those of us that don't do well with it. Thanks be to God. Three, five, six. I invite us to remain standing so that we might join together in the affirmation of faith. So together we say, by his mighty power, God raised from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ and seated him at his right hand in heaven, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given not only in the present age, but also in the age to come. God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything, everywhere and always. Amen. Friends, you may be seated. There are a number of announcements in the worship guide, and I would direct your attention to those. Um, but also an announcement that needs to be made, I found out from several folks that I apparently have asked people for Apple gift cards. Yeah, it's a scam, and it's happening. So 
I can speak for myself, and I'll speak for you as well. We would never do that, okay? So if you get this urgent text from us, please do this, do this, do this. Nah. Nah, 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 nah. Just don't. I know it's happened before, and there'll be future things that'll come up. Let us be wise as serpents and innocent as doves and be generous of spirit but not taken in by uh, the stuff that just makes you go like that. Thank you for throwing me under the bus this morning. I appreciate that. <laughs> Actually, it's my mother who did that, but anyway. Are there any special announcements that need to be made today? Then, friends, let us take note of the joys and concerns that are among us and within our hearts and minds. Some of the prayer concerns that we have today include Jean Grau asking uh, for prayers for Brian with his eye problems and medical tests. Lisa is asking for prayers for Fred. Ellen Santoro is asking for prayers for her sister Donna, who's going for open heart surgery and also her son-in-law, Paul, who's recovering from ACL surgery. Mike Apilla is asking for prayers for Tom Coulter, for Paul, for John and Connie Dudas. Joan Bentley Reynolds Lemke asking for prayers for herself as she has to undergo a cardiac catheterization of all four chambers of her heart this coming Wednesday. Laura Edward Smith is asking for prayers for Greg Kruger, who's in hospice care, for Mike Blackburn, undergoing radiation, for John Piazza and Carrie Bartlett, for Sky Back and Richard Brown. Jeffrey Willis is asking for prayers for Cindy Jones, for Cindy Raspoli, and for Lori Ox. Additional prayer concerns coming to us this morning as you entered the sanctuary. Prayers for Esther and for Kim, for Michelle and for Carmen, for Bob, for Bev, for Robin, prayers for Bobby, and for Anita, and for Penny. Well, friends, let us take a few moments of silence as we commune with our God in prayer and then join together in the pastoral prayer and the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Lord our God, once again you have gifted us with the glories of a new day. And we praise you for the beauty of creation around us, for everything that speaks, indeed shouts, cries out to your power, and your presence, and your glory. This day, O oh God, we're mindful of blessings that we can't even begin to count. For good health, for strength, for the ability to earn a wage, for the ability to know we're in community with one another and we have connections. We're, we're not going it alone for our families, for our friends, for this country in which we live, for all the many things, O oh God, that we can't take any credit for, and yet nevertheless you shower upon us. This day we're mindful of those whose names we have lifted up in prayer that you might be with them, your power and presence might rest upon them, that they might find answers to the prayers that they seek, to the prayers that others have lifted up on their behalf. This day, O oh God, we're mindful of the ongoing horrors and tragedy in, in Gaza, and we pray, O oh God, for an end to the violence, that, that somehow uh, the desire for, for what we think is justice or revenge or retribution or the lists that we have that justify whatever we think we ought to do, that somehow those might be counterbalanced by compassion, by concern, by care for the littlest and for the least, for those who are lost and those who are struggling this day. And not just there, but on our city streets, and not just there, but in the towns and, and highways and byways of 
of the Ukraine, and not just there, but everywhere where your people are struggling this day, O oh God. May they see a reason for hope. May you give strength to leaders of nations to not only desire to do right, but to indeed seek to do that in all that they can do with the power that is at their disposal. So too, as we bring it down close, help us, oh God, to not only will to do the things and want to do the things that are right, but actually to do those even as we confess that often we're like the Apostle Paul who says, the thing I know I should do, I don't, and the very thing I should stay away from, that's the thing I gravitate toward. Wretch that I am, who can free me from this body of death? And then he answers his own question. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory in Christ Jesus our Lord, who taught us to pray and to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Sisters and brothers, God's ancient steadfast love is not a love that simply waits for us to stop wandering and return home. God's love comes seeking us and gives us the gift of Jesus so that we might have life abundant. Our giving this morning, whether we have been lost and wandering or secure and safe, expresses our firm conviction that God is with us no matter what. So let us gather our gifts together and offer them to God in gratitude, in heartfelt commitment, and praise. As we receive our offerings here in the sanctuary, we invite those worshiping online to take advantage of the various ways in which your gratitude and generosity can be expressed, in, which are mentioned in the worship guide. So ushers, I invite you to come forward. Let us join together in prayer, saying, O oh, merciful God, we give thanks to you for your steadfast love endures forever. May these gifts be used to feed the hungry and satisfy the thirst of all those you love throughout your creation. Amen. I invite you to remain standing as we join together in hymn number 513, Let Us Break Bread Together. Let us pray. 
Before we begin, our, <coughs> excuse me. Before we begin our celebration of the table, uh, a word of apology to those worshiping us online. I meant to mention this earlier to give you an opportunity to get some bread and some juice, but hopefully you've been able to do that, so you might join with us in this celebration and extend God's table to wherever you may be. Friends, if your seeking has led you here. If your weary heart followed breadcrumbs all the way to this sanctuary, then there's good news. You do not have to seek anymore. This table is God's table. So if you came here looking for justice, then rest in the comfort that all will be fed here. If you came seeking beauty, then let your spirit marvel at the beauty of a community coming together. If you came seeking a brush with the divine, then know that God is present in this ordinary meal. So kick off your walking shoes, let your weary heart stop the search, because we are standing on holy ground. This is God's table. All are invited. So come. As we prepare to receive these good gifts of God, I invite you to join with me in the great prayer of thanksgiving, the opening litany of which is found printed in the worship guide. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right, and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. In love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, your love remains steadfast. You bid your faithful people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Easter feast that, renewed by your word and sacraments and fervent in prayer and works of justice and mercy, we may come to the fullness of grace that you have prepared for those who love you. Blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to redeem the world. He emptied himself, 
taking the form of a servant, being born in our likeness, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. He took upon himself our sin and death and offered himself a perfect sacrifice for the sin of the whole world. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us gathered here and upon these your gifts of the fruit of the field and the fruit of the vine. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. And let all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Friends, let us remember the story of our faith, how it was on the night of our Lord's arrest, when he was at table with his disciples, he took bread. He gave thanks to God, and then he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after supper, Jesus took the cup. Once again, he gave thanks to God, and then he gave it to his disciples, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood. All of you drink of it for the forgiveness of your sins. And so it is that as often as we eat of the bread and drink of the cup, we remember and we celebrate Christ's death, his resurrection, and his promised second coming until he comes again in glory. Brothers and sisters, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come and let us share the feast. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Let us feast upon him in our hearts with thanksgiving.
Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So let us celebrate the spiritual connections we have with God and with one another. Amen. Please join me in prayer. God of grace and love, we came to this table hungry and we leave feeling full, full of hope, full of promise, full of what could be. For we not only found glimpses of you at this table, but we caught a glimpse of the way things could be in a meal where all are welcomed and all are fed. May we always seek you the way you seek after us, with grateful hearts we pray, amen. Friends, I invite you to rise in body or in spirit that we might together sing hymn number 485, To God Be the Glory. Okay, expect me to tell you to be patient this week. Yeah, well, try. This last hymn was great. Give him the glory for great things he hath done. Keep in mind that we learn from history what God has done, the great things, is still in the future. God will continue to do great things. So be patient, be hopeful, be joyful, because God does great things. And may the love of God and the grace of Jesus Christ and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.